Um, I think we can start. So we two of us will tell you something about core scheduling in Xen. It's some work I'm doing since late of last year. So um, I've been working a lot on it. Um, little introduction, what is core scheduling? Why do we want to do that? How? Does it work? Uh, then Dario will tell something about performance numbers he's got and compare the Xen core scheduling um, with the Linux core scheduling series, which is um, just active on the Linux kernel mailing list. And then I will conclude with the current state of the work. So what is core scheduling? Um, today, we have typical CPU scheduling um, in the Xen hypervisor on each physical CPU. Um, the scheduler will decide uh, locally which vCPU is to be scheduled next. And it will normally only look, look uh, into other physical CPUs um, for considering whether the load of the system is okay or maybe a vCPU should be pulled from another physical CPU to the local one. Um, each virtual CPU on the system can normally run on each physical CPU within some constraints which may be put uh, by the user. For example, uh, by pinning the vCPU to a subset of physical CPUs or by introducing, uh, by using CPU pools, uh, which can be used to partition the physical machine into smaller entities. So with CPU scheduling, normally we have the virtual CPUs um, floating around more or less uh, on the physical CPUs. So I've physical cores with two threads each in this picture. And every virtual CPU being able to run will be put on, uh, on a physical thread and left be running. Uh, the virtual CPUs not being able to run because they are idle, blocked, waiting for RIO, something like that, will be in blocked state and floating around and on the unpopulated physical threads, the idle virtual CPUs are normally running. So this is the case, uh, a picture where only DOM0, so the control domain of the host is running. When I'm adding another guest, those, the virtual CPUs of this guest will be just scheduled like the observer virtual CPU, so it can well be that uh, the virtual CPUs of different domains are running together on the same physical core. Um, when, for example, another virtual CPU of them zero is becoming ready to run and it may, might have a higher priority than the normal uh, guest domain, a uh, ready-to-run uh, virtual CPU can add up in the run queue, so waiting for some physical, result, uh, physical CPU to become free to be run again. But that's normal over-commitment over of the host. That can happen at any time. So what's about core scheduling then? The main difference is that the scheduler is no longer acting on virtual CPUs, but on virtual cores. So all siblings or threads of a core are scheduled together, and the scheduling of all siblings of a single core is synchronized. And the relation between virtual cores and virtual CPUs is fixed, so they are always together, uh, the virtual CPUs of a virtual core, they are not uh, changing places during lifetime of the system. Um, in contrast to that, core aware scheduling would be that the scheduler is looking into only scheduling ever uh, virtual CPUs of the same guest on the same physical core, but those could be changed. 
And another thing with coarse gate dueling is that pinning and CPU pools are affecting cores. So when I'm pinning a virtual CPU to a specific physical CPU, I will pin at the same time the sibling virtual CPU. So the picture then will be that two virtual CPUs are always together in one virtual core, which is then put onto a physical core. So it can be that an idle virtual CPU is more or less put on a physical core, of course doing nothing then, but there's no way the virtual CPU of another guest could replace that as long as here uh, the uh, virtual core is scheduled on the physical core. So looking a little bit strange, but I will come to the motivation why we want to do that. So with another guest added, of course, here again, the virtual CPUs are put into, the uh, into virtual cores, which are scheduled. So even if I have ready to run virtual CPUs of the guest, um, they need a physical core to become free because they can be run, right? And of course, the scheduler has to take the decision when to preempt the virtual core here to let that one run on the physical core. So why would we want to do that? Well, here, that's one reason. <laughs> uh, the recent or quite not quite so recent CPU bugs uh, like L1TF, MDS, um, are using side channel attacks to steal data from the siblings on the same core. And of course, in a hypervisor, I don't want to let one guest steal data of another one. So I don't want to let two guests run on the same core of a vulnerable CPU at the same time, because then it could happen that one guest is stealing data from the other one through one of those CPU bugs. So core scheduling prohibits cross-domain side channel attacks. Um, that's not sufficient to mitigate against all the problems of those CPU bugs, but it's necessary. So this is a major groundwork for safe operation uh, with uh, guests, so in hypervisor mode with uh, symmetric multi-threading enabled. So today, you have to disable SMT in order to be safe against those CPU bugs, which is, of course, a performance hit, as Dario will tell later. Another thing is fairness of accounting. So threads running on the same core share multiple resources like execution units, TLB, caches, and so on. So they can influence each other regarding performance. Of course, threads running on the same socket do so via the level three cache, and even running on several, on different sockets, they influence each other regarding memory accesses. So, but uh, threads on the same core influence each other much more than running on more distinct resources. So when I think of a cloud environment, with normal CPU scheduling, a guest CPU performance is depending a lot on the host's load, not only on the guest load. So it can happen that I'm running my virtual host, my virtual machine, in the cloud, and the host is rather unpopulated, I'm seeing a very fine performance. And suddenly, Dario is firing up his virtual machine, hogging CPUs and doing whatever he can, and suddenly my performance is dropping. Not because I'm 
put away from the CPU, but because he is using TUB caches and execution units a lot, and is running by chance on the same core than my virtual CPU is running. And to make it even worse, when I'm using a cloud where I'm paying the hoster by CPU time used, um, even the hoster could fire up some CPU hogging uh, virtual machines, letting, making me having to pay more because I'm using more CPU time. That's not how it should be, right? So it's really a matter of fairness when you're running guests of different customers on the same machine to share, let them share the lowest amount of resources as possible. And additionally, there might be some guest site optimizations. So if we look into bare metal Linux kernel, it tries to make SMT aware scheduling. So maybe if I have several threads of the same process, when they are running together on the same core, they will get better performance as if they were running on different cores because they can share cache TLB entries and whatever. <clears throat> or the guest system might decide to let only one thread on a single core in order to let it make use of all the resources of that core. If the other thread is kept idle, idle the single thread might get better performance depending on the workload, of course. And last but not least, again, the CPU bugs. The guest might have some interest to not let run different processes on the same core, just for the same reason as the hypervisor doesn't want to let run different guests on the same core. So how does that all work? Um, I think it's worthwhile to have a brief introduction into today's scheduler architecture to make the following a little bit more, to put the following a little bit more into context. So the Xen scheduler architecture has one feature called CPU pools where you can partition a physical machine into different pools. And as the name suggests, in each CPU pool, uh, so each CPU can be only member of one CPU pool. And why do I want to do that? Because I can have, each CPU pool has an own dedicated scheduler, so I can reduce locking conflicts and I can have different scheduler parameter, uh, par parameters per CPU pool. And of course, a single guest can only ever be at one time in one CPU pool. So a guest ca can't uh, span several CPU pools. Of course, I can move CPUs and guests between CPU pools, but that's a manual intervention more or less and uh, is costing some time. Xen internal. Um, all scheduler-related interfaces are handled by one source named schedule.c. So um, all interfaces uh, throughout the in uh, hypervisor related to scheduling are in that single source. And that single source will call into the correct scheduler code uh, when it is needed via normal function vectors. And there multiple different schedulers available for different purposes. So originally, scan at uh, the credit scheduler, there has been a replacement by credit2, which is the default since the last release for the 12. Um, we have a real-time scheduler, scatrt, um, which is, of course, used for real-time domains. There's a very special purpose scheduler uh, used in aviation environments. 
I think it's only one company using it, but they've upstreamed it. And we have a very dump scheduler, the null scheduler, uh, which is not meant to be used for overcommitted hosts, but only able to distinguish between a guest CPU or the idle C uh, the CPU. And all of these schedulers today only are working on vCPU, so they are scheduling virtual CPUs on physical CPUs. And we have another concept in Xen called Tasklets, where asynchronous work can be done inside the hypervisor, which is running in the context of idle vCPUs. <coughs> so, how is core scheduling integrated into that? Um, the first is uh, I did some decoupling scheduling uh, from CPUs. So in the single schedulers, I'm removing all the vCPU references and replacing them with sched units or scheduling units. And the physical CPU references are all replaced by scheduling resources. Um, the scheduling decisions are the same as before. So the uh, single schedulers will just look into sched uh, scheduling units, which of course then will contain one or multiple virtual CPUs. And uh, we'll try to put the scheduling units on the correct schedu uh, scheduling resource. Um, this resulted, of course, of a rather high diff stat, but uh, those were mostly mechanical, so I guess more than 90% of my patch series were mechanical changes. And scheduler.c is still acting as an abstraction layer for the rest of the hypervisor, so the rest of the hypervisor has barely to notice uh, those changes. There are some changes, but they are very limited. And uh, just of a proof of concept, a scheduling resource can not only be a CPU or a core, but uh, with, I guess, 20 or 30 lines of code, it was even expanded to be able to cover a complete socket. I could make it a NUMA node or whatever else, so it's quite easy. That was just a proof of concept that the abstraction is fine. The next major change is the syncing of context switches. <laughs> Remember, we don't want ever have two guests running on the same core. So when switching from one scheduling unit to another, I have, of course, to switch all the vCPUs. Um, but not in an uncorrelated fashion, but I have to coordinate that. Coordinate. So all the other virtual CPUs of the unit must be switched on the scheduling resource and they have to coordinate. So I've syncing uh, in there in two steps. So first, I'm making the decision which scheduling unit is to be put next on the local resource. Then I'm syncing, uh, I'm calling into all physical CPUs of that resource to, uh, to rendezvous all the CPUs in the scheduling code. Then I can context switch, so switch the virtual CPUs on the physical CPUs. And when that is done, I can proceed, but only if all have finished. Why is that important? Because context switching includes switching address space. And when switching the address space, the TLB is being cleared or can be cleared. And uh, maybe the cache is required. So this is the major thing to be done before uh, run, letting the guest run in guest mode again, to be sure that it can't peek into another guest's data. So at no time, two virtual CPUs of different scheduling units are running in guest mode on the same scheduling resource or physical core in that case. So in single steps, 
if I have a schedule event on one CPU, the, which is a soft ICO like in Linux kernel, I'm taking the schedule log, call into the specific scheduler for selecting the next unit to run. If there's no change, because maybe there's no other guest waiting for uh, resources, I can drop the log and exit. And the other vCPUs of the same <coughs> scheduling unit can just continue to run. If there is a change, I have to signal other CPUs, um, process a new introduced schedule slave event, which will then drop the log, uh, which will switch the vCPUs to already selected scheduling unit. I can drop the log and wait for others to join. And the last CPU to join this party will switch the scheduling unit and freeze the others to continue. And then all CPUs can do the context switch in parallel, then wait that all have done the context switch for being sure that the address space has been switched, and leave schedule handling with a new guest probably running then. Sounds rather complicated, but I think the data shows it's not as bad as it sounds. Of course, it's not as good as without core schedule. Well, there is some overhead, of course. One specialty are idle vCPUs. So we remember the picture in the beginning when I have a virtual core scheduled and one virtual CPU of the guest is becoming idle in that virtual core. What is happening then? Well, um, the idle vCPU of that physical CPU will be scheduled there. Um, but uh, the context switch, of, uh, so switch of the address space isn't happening. It even isn't happening today with only CPU scheduling when the idle vCPU is replacing um, a guest virtual CPU just because it might be that the same guest CPU will be, uh, virtual CPU will be scheduled again afterwards. So I'm sparing probably two context switches or two address space switches. If, of course, another virtual CPU is coming after idle, the context switch is done. So there is no change, at least on x86 today. And another change I've done is when the idle vCPU is running more or less in guest context, it won't run any tasklets because that's asynchronous hypervisor work which might be related to another guest. And another area which is touched are CPU pools. Uh, so only, of course, completely uh, scheduled resources can be moved from a two CPU pools. Otherwise, I would have half a core and I don't know what to schedule on there. Um, but CPU pl hot plug is normally done in single CPU entities, right? So CPUs not being part of any CPU pool are still uh, handled individually, not in get resource uh, units. Um, at system boot, uh, CPU pool no, uh, zero, so the uh, default CPU pool will only be populated after all CPUs have come up to make sure I know how many CPUs are part of a scheduling resource. And there's another thing, uh, previously CPUs not in any pool have been handled by the same scheduler as CPU pool zero. That had to be changed because now they are individually and the CPU pool zero scheduler will use probably core scheduling. So I've introduced another scheduler which is even more dumb than the null scheduler because it can only ever schedule the idle vCPU. So that scheduler is only 40 or 50 lines of code. It's very simple. And CPU hot plug had to be changed. So in Xen, it's possible to switch 
SMT on and off at runtime. With core scheduling, this would be kind of um, rude because suddenly half of the guests' virtual CPUs had nothing to run on, so we can't do that. And offlining and onlining of a CPU requires to remove the CPU from any pool before doing it because it might have to be split off, uh, split uh, from the uh, uh, scheduling resource before being able to offline it. So I think, yeah, we can skip that. It's more or less. If I have CPUs in the CPU pool, I have to remove them first before being able to remove the CPU. Then I can hand over to Dario. You have to switch on yourself. Can I have a question? Um, so what do you do if one of the guests uh, does VM exit? Uh, more specifically, do you prevent a case where one guest is running in the VM mode and the other guest is running either hypervisor or DOM0? No, not yet. That's after his performance stuff, uh, I will have some final remarks and okay, that's okay. part of it. Thanks, sorry. <laughs> can, can I go ahead? Yeah, I guess I can. <coughs> Right, so yes, uh, I'm Dario. I am uh, one of the Xen scheduler maintainers. So my uh, involvement in all these uh, is basically to review Jurgen patches so they can go uh, in, they can go apply, they can be applied to Xen and be part of the, the next release, and running benchmarks. And uh, I have run benchmarks, and uh, uh, the results of these uh, benchmarking activities, what I'm going to talk about uh, right now. Um, so what uh, uh, what was the uh, configuration, uh, what benchmark did I run? Uh, well, yeah, it is. So I used a, a machine, a system which has four core and of course has hyper-trading, so it has a total of eight CPUs if hyper-trading is enabled, four if it's disabled. Uh, I run my benchmarks in DOM0, uh, which is also representative of uh, uh, what you will get if you run them in a PV guest, because DOM0 to a special one is a PV guest, paravirtualized guest, uh, and also in uh, uh, HVN guest. Uh, and I used uh, uh, HVN guest uh, with four vCPUs, eight vCPUs, and I also ran the benchmark in an uh, overcommitted uh, uh, scenario. So, yeah, we'll see, we'll see about that later. And I uh, ran the benchmark. Uh, without any uh, of Jurgen patches, uh, and with the effort trading disabled and enabled. Then with Jurgen patches, but core scheduling disabled, because even after uh, uh, having uh, the patches applied, you can uh, decide whether you want core scheduling uh, enabled or not. You decide basically at boot time. And then, of course, the, the interesting case, which is uh, uh, patches applied and core scheduling enabled. And I run a bunch of benchmarks. Uh, I'll show, I will show some of the results that I have here. I have more than that, and we can, uh, and I can share them, uh, we can discuss about them, uh, or whatever. So first of all, just uh, to at least uh, uh, touch it, uh, are we sure we have to do all this work? Well, I, sh I hope we are, because it's more than a year that we are doing that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, after all, uh, uh, if we disable hyper-trading, maybe uh, I mean, if the performance hits is not too much, then we can uh, forget about all these, uh, stop the presentation here, go have a coffee. And, uh, and yes, we have thrown, thrown away one year more, but that's our problem, I guess. Uh, well, actually, it, uh, um, it looked like it, this could actually be the case, because, for example, if you look at the results of stream benchmark, and, uh, oh, yes, something that I should mention is that uh, all the numbers that you would see in all the tables that I have are all percent increase or uh, decrease, uh, and they are the reference uh, uh, is always uh, the case where there were no patches applied and uh, hyper trading was enabled okay so what this plus 3 plus 4 means uh, means that if you without any patches so without even uh, starting to think or discuss about uh, the work we are done you just disable hyper trading and you run stream what you get is a performance increase so it looks like uh, disabling hyper training is uh, what you want to do, and uh, we don't, you don't need any of these. But, of course, uh, well, of course, uh, uh, it turns out that uh, there are other workloads 
such as, for example, can bench, but uh, mm, these are just two examples. I have other works of behaving like stream, I have other works of behaving like can bench, uh, where, uh, especially when the load increase, disabling hyperthreading in means that you are facing a uh, performance uh, regression of roughly 20 30 percent, which is actually the value that you always hear the, the common sense is hyperthreading uh, gives you a 30 percent performance hit. So, perf yes, uh, performance improvement. So, I guess they were running their bench when, <laughs> when uh, uh, yeah, uh, then coming to this number. So the answer is it's work code dependent. Actually, it's work code dependent is the answer of all my benchmarking activity. I would, could just say it's work code dependent and hand over the mic, but uh, <laughs> it's not to that and uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, these things a little, a little bit more. So let's just uh, look at a few things. I'm not going to go over all the numbers uh, in great detail. Again, ask later if, uh, uh, if you're interested in uh, more insights. <coughs> Let's just focus, for example, these are the benchmarks run on uh, DOM0 uh, Xengest, uh, well, on DOM0 uh, in our Xen system. So let's just focus on the overhead of the patch uh, that the patches introduces. And we do it uh, by looking at these numbers, because uh, th this column is where I have the numbers for patches applied, but core scheduling disabled. So it's basically the overhead that the patches introduce. And as we can see, uh, from here, from here, from here, especially the overhead is not. So basically, what we want, what we would want, would be these numbers to be all zero, because it means that the patches doesn't introduce any overhead. It's not zero. Sometimes it's uh, it's even. Uh, and, and if we saw, if you saw a minus, it means less performance. So it means that there is some overhead. If you saw a plus, it means that the patches actually improve performances, uh, widely or not depends. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean. Um, Small values in the plus side or small values in the minus side means that uh, we are doing fine and we are here, here, and here. We are doing not too good, but not even too bad because it's 5% uh, overhead here and here. But um, yeah, that's uh, bearable, I would say, considering uh, uh, what core scheduling uh, is actually, as Jurgen uh, explained us. And in HVM domains, it's uh, similar, also the cases which were uh, hit most uh, in even in the PV guest are he here are hit even uh, farther. The overhead is uh, uh, even larger, and uh, this is something that we um, we have to investigate. I mean, there are a lot of numbers. Any r any uh, entry in these tables would serve uh, some uh, investigation tracing, and uh, we are in the process of doing that. I don't have all the answers for all the uh, situations here. Uh, right, then uh, another thing that we can look at is the actual, um, uh, having uh, considered the overhead, let's look at actual performance numbers, which uh, we uh, get uh, if we look at uh, these two columns, the numbers in these two columns, because here is what happens if you disable hypertraining, and here is what happens if you leave it enabled but use core scheduling. So if the um, results here, if the performance hit that we incur uh, in this case is uh, um, higher than uh, uh, the one that we see here, then, thank you, then it means that core scheduling uh, uh, is not uh, worthwhile. Uh, well, uh, there are a few of these uh, benchmarks where uh, we actually see that core scheduling is doing quite well. So, for example, this one, because in can bench, if you disable hyper trading, you get uh, 30, uh, more than 30% performance hit, while it's only five with core scheduling. And uh, uh, other cases, there are uh, other which is, uh, uh, which, uh, where this is not at all the case, like here, disabling or, or with stream, as, uh, as we saw before. Uh, because uh, disabling hyper threading is only slightly affecting performance, while core scheduling is affecting performance more. So yes, it's tricky because it's workload dependent. It's always going to be workload dependent. Uh, and um, we saw uh, the HVM uh, as similar pattern. Something that I wanted to show is what happens in the overcommitted scenario. So here I was using on an eight CPU, eight physical CPU host. I was using. Uh, uh, two VMs with a VCPU e e VCPUs each, so I'm basically uh, using twice as much VCPUs as I have physical CPUs. And here, core scheduling is looking quite nice because you see that pretty much everywhere, apart from, in this case, ArcBench, but even the cases where like Stream and NetPerf 
uh, without overcommitment, uh, uh, core scheduling was doing bad. Here, it's doing quite good because it always uh, impacts the performance less than disabling FHA. So it's always more, uh, it's always, it, will, it would always be better if you have overcommitment to use core scheduling instead of disabling hypertraining, apart from some workload which we are investigating why that is the case. So yeah, these are tables which I just put in the uh, presentation to have it in case they are useful. It's a uh, more detailed uh, uh, representation of the same numbers. And you see, for example, David Kernbench, uh, uh, in the, in the non-overcommit case, it's only when load increases uh, that you uh, get um, core scheduling to be uh, effective because you have uh, hypertraining disabled, which loses a lot, and the core scheduling that uh, helps you recover from that. In the overcommitted case, it's uh, all over the place, at least for this benchmark. So yeah, um, then ah, yeah, there is this topic, which is uh, interesting. Well, let's try to cover it quickly. The basically, at least in the implementation that we decide to go for in Zen, uh, core scheduling appears, at, uh, at least for now, to not be ideal if you have an underloaded system. But that's uh, because, as you see, it's uh, uh, pretty much always worse. Uh, that's because uh, our um, uh, SMT-aware scheduling works in uh, the Xen hypervisor. It's uh, pretty similar in, uh, in Linux uh, because uh, basically what you have with regular CPU scheduling is just is, is that uh, the scheduler try to, if it, can, if it can, and it can if you have an overloaded system, an underloaded system, sorry. Uh, to spread the work because it's more efficient to run uh, uh, vCPUs on full cores. But with core scheduling, you can't do that. And so you see this uh, uh, very bad uh, um, behavior. But uh, there are, for on, on one side of the, mm, on one end, uh, I should say that yes, you see uh, worse performance, but uh, they are more consistent in the cloud scenario, for example, that Jurgen was. Uh, uh, talking about when talking about fairness of accounting. Uh, and on the other end, uh, uh, we have to say that uh, uh, there is something that you can do about it. For example, introducing uh, uh, in-guest uh, uh, SMT aware scheduling that would probably improve this uh, uh, situation. The fact is we don't, uh, we still have to do that. And very, very quickly, uh, I also have a look, had a look at uh, how what's the situation in Linux. I thought it would be uh, in something that I'm doing, and I thought it could be interesting to uh, talk uh, about it uh, here as well. Uh, there are ongoing efforts to have core scheduling in uh, Linux as well, for example, for using it on KVM, or not only on KVM. Of course, we are interested in that because we are the virtualization team. But it's general. Uh, it's not bound to uh, KVM or virt virtualization use case. Uh, the patches are, the work is a little bit less mature because, uh, well, Jürgen will tell you about what the status and what the plan are for Xen, while in Linux uh, we are not in RFC state. Yeah, I'll rush. <laughs> we are not in RFC state in Zen, while patches are in RFC state for Linux. And, of course, well, the Linux uh, scheduler is uh, uh, more complex than Xen one because it wants to be a general purpose scheduler, and so the problem is different and uh, also more complex. Uh, and uh, the approach, of course, is different because there are different scheduler code base uh, and uh, the uh, design has been different. So there are, uh, uh, well, differences. Sorry, it's the five time I say difference. And um, yeah, let's keep uh, about the exact details. You can, uh, again, ask me uh, later if you want. And the performance number that I have, again, preliminary um, are guess, workload dependent. <laughs> Uh, in the sense that, for example, if you run Kerbench, if you run it on bare metal core scheduling, I'm talking about uh, running stuff on Linux n now, not uh, Zen is not uh, in the future any longer. Looks quite good because, yes, uh, regresses a little, but it regress regresses less than uh, uh, hypertraining disabled. Uh, and that's the same actually uh, when you run inside a VM. Both if you use eight vCPUs, so no overcommitment. Uh, in the overcommitment case, so uh, all good. RFC, still RFC, RFC, but it works perfectly. We are fine. Uh, uh. Well, not really, because different workload, and you have bare metal running the benchmark of bare metal, still going quite good. Then you put the benchmark inside the VM, and weirdly enough, you have these terrible results. Uh, much worse than uh, without uh, uh, hypertraining, much worse than an that anything actually. And of course, we have to uh, identify why, but uh, yeah, patches are still RFC in this case. So 
Um, and that's it, I think. Yeah, that's all I have. So I hand over back to Jürgen for current state of the exam efforts. Okay, um, the current state, it's rather fast. So I've made several cleanup series, some in debugging enhancements for checking out all the bugs which I encountered, which were quite a lot, I have to admit. So currently I have about 34 patches which are already in Xen. Um, the rest is in review, currently 5 to 1 patches left um, with several thousand lines of code modifying. Um, review is more or less halfway through, uh, Dario is working on that, if not doing presentations. Um, <laughs> All comments of version 2 have been addressed, but of course not all patches have been reviewed in that version. And we are planning to let that be part of the next Sensories product 13, which should be released end of 2019. And the release manager of Xen is fine with that because he's just presenting here. Um, the future plans are um, we want to add ARM support. Right now it's only capable to run on x86 with core scheduling. So ARM is still limited to CPU scheduling, even with the patches in. Um, I have plans to do some per CPU pool setting of scheduling granularity. Um, and SMT on off switching per CPU pool. Um, we need to add some same topology reporting to the guest so, so that the guest is capable to do for example, uh, mitigation against uh, the CPU bugs. And as already asked, um, we need some hypercall syncing between threads for full mitigation, which will probably kill the performance for most workloads. But we'll have to see. So that's all. Uh, Thank you very much. Can I add this? Test. Okay. Yeah. So uh, just uh, as I said, as I was saying, since I mentioned the uh, also the status of uh, Linux efforts uh, with respect to these. Uh, so the fact that uh, if you maybe you want to use cross scheduling for uh, whatever reason, but if you want to use it uh, as a mean of mitigating uh, uh, vulnerabilities such as LTF and one uh, MDS and one TF. Then in Zen, as Jürgen said, we have the synchronization of content switches, but we don't yet have uh, uh, the, uh, all the bits and pieces in place to avoid uh, one thread to be in a guest and the other thread to be in the hypervisor. In Linux, uh, as I said, uh, efforts is still uh, uh, less mature, and in fact, in those patch series uh, on which I run the benchmarks, uh, there is uh, no synchronization of content switches, and there is, uh, of course, uh, not even uh, uh, the, this other part of uh, yeah, so that's the status about the thing that you were asking. Okay. Any other question? <coughs> no? So we, knew, we knew. That's why. <laughs> Thank you very much.